Good morning, Glendale, Vallejo Drive. Happy Sabbath. It's really a delight to be with you, to worship with you. Uh, I was telling Pastor Mark, my wife's parents are both church organists. So it's just a delight to worship and hear the organ this morning and the choir and, and everything. Can we, oh, I've got this, right? Wrong. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see how this works. Okay. Yeah, okay. There we go. So anyway, um, our, our sermon title this morning is Overcoming Religious Intolerance, but, but let me just kind of give a quick introduction to religious liberty ministry, because for most, for most of us, if we think about it at all, maybe we realize that we publish Liberty Magazine but, or take up an offering once a year, but we don't really grasp the, the scope and the significance of our church's religious liberty ministry. A few weeks ago, I was in South Florida. You know, my timing was impeccable, right? And uh, earlier this summer, I was in Houston, too. Go figure. Uh, I think the Lord's looking over me. but. Um, uh, in South Florida was the 8th World Congress of the International Religious Liberty Association, which the Adventist Church founded back in 1893, the world's oldest uh, organization devoted to religious freedom. And this was a gathering of people from 65 nations. Uh, there were lawyers, there were government officials, people from the State Department, uh, leaders of many different faiths, and it was a, a three-day conference on, uh, you know, building bridges and, and, and bridging the gap and, and overcoming intolerance and dealing with the global issues that, that face us. And we're going to look at that today. The Adventist Church has been a leader for more than a century in dealing with these issues internationally, and it's something I think we can all be proud of. Um, here, closer to home, I serve a five-state region for the Adventist Church. A lot of our work is here in California. And kind of our bread and butter has been to help our church members who face conflicts at work because of Sabbath. Uh, you'd be surprised, perhaps, at how often these conflicts arise and how many calls we get weekly, monthly, yearly, and over the years, our load has grown, and we have developed the Church State Council into the foremost legal services organization, helping not just our own church members, but people of all faiths who suffer religious discrimination and harassment. And, you know, when I meet people when I'm out and about, flying on a plane or what have you, sometimes I get the, you know, quizzical look. You mean that still happens? Uh, people are surprised at how much religious discrimination and harassment there is. But we'll, we'll talk about that. Your bulletin insert, you'll see a legislative alert, a bill that is now, uh, was buried over the summer recess and has reemerged and is being pushed through. We expect to be opposing it with the governor's office, but everything we can do to help. Um, we face literally existential threats to the very existence of religious colleges and universities here in California. Uh, you, I hope you are aware of the bill that we dealt with last year that really would have prevented us from operating as a religious institution, whether we're talking Pacific Union College or La Sierra or Loma Linda, we would have had to shed our religious scruples in order to remain in California. That's essentially what the bill was requiring at one point in one version of it. You know, we live in a culture that takes an increasingly dim view of the traditional values of the various religions, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. And uh, one of our speakers this afternoon at uh, the rally at uh, the Filipino Church is Dwayne Leslie, our Legislative Affairs Director for the General Conference. He represents the church on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. 
and he's going to talk about what they're trying to do in Washington to find a legislative compromise between uh, the LGBT rights issues on the one hand that are becoming such a challenge for the religious community and religious freedom on the other, an effort called Fairness for All. So I, I hope many of you will be able and, and want to join us there. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we're also involved in outreach, not just within our own community and churches, but frequently speaking at legal conferences um, for other faiths and, and other venues. We know that religious intolerance globally is an enormous problem. How do we respond as Christians? As we get into the sermon, I'd just like to ask you to bow your heads with me. I'd like to offer a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you know what's weighing on my heart this morning, but uh, my larger burden is that you would speak peace and truth and your grace to your congregation this morning, that your presence would be here with us as you have promised as we come to worship you this Sabbath. Speak through me, Lord. I just want to surrender myself to you again, my words, my thoughts, for Christ's sake and in his name. Amen. This is a shocking statistic. It's an alarming statistic. 76%, this comes from uh, Pew Research, um, widely quoted, widely discussed, 76% of the global population live in nations with little or no religious freedom. Most of the world does not enjoy the freedom that we take for granted here in the United States. State Department reports Christians being persecuted in some 60 countries around the world. If we hear about persecution, if we hear about intolerance at all, chances are we hear about the persecution of Christians. But it's not just Christians. You may not have heard of a Islamic minority group called the Yazidis in Iraq. Uh, before ISIS uh, strength was uh, reduced, it was all out attempt to eradicate the Yazidis. Um, and you can see how deliberate they were. Uh, this is uh, current news. This picture was taken a week ago. This is a picture of uh, a Muslim minority community in Burma, the Rohingya, whose villages are being uh, systematically destroyed by the army there and uh, literally hundreds of thousands of refugees displaced um, people without a country. The Burmese don't recognize them. They consider them as illegal immigrants and unwanted. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Of course, uh, in the 20th century, um, there was a massive exodus of Jews from the Arab nations of the Middle East and Iran. Uh, nearly a million Jews at the start of the 20th century, um, perhaps as many as 20,000 remaining. Um, you folks are here in, uh, you know, in Glendale, you know that there's a large Persian Jewish community here in Southern California. Why? It's not just because we're the land of opportunity, it's because they were not welcome and they left. But anti-Semitism against Jews is not simply a thing for the Arab-Israeli conflict or for the Arab nations. Just a few weeks ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, what we may think of as a kind of racist, anti-black right-wing march, the slogans were not anti-black, they were anti-Semitic, weren't they? Blood and soil. The origins of blood and soil were the Nazi regime in the 1930s. Um, and, and the phrase blood and soil, God and country, 
was part of the original slogan. And if you think about it, that is the spirit that we see in Revelation 13, the spirit that gives us the mark of the beast, the spirit that blends God and country, faith and patriotism, and excludes people on the basis of their religion. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, we read Revelation 13 and we see ourselves as the objects of derision because of our Sabbath observance. But have you ever considered that we might be an afterthought? That after all, there's another group of Sabbath observers who have been the object of satanic fury for centuries, for millennia. Does that make any sense? Does that compute? In any event, I suspect we will be all in the same boat. Oops, let's see here. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. These come from Pew Research Center. These are a little bit old, but they give you um, a very good picture, first, of where there are government and legal restrictions on religious freedom. And you see uh, Russia, you see China, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, countries like that. I hope you're aware and concerned about the uh, persecution of Jehovah Witnesses in Russia. The Adventist Church has been quiet about this problem because our brethren in Russia have asked us to. They're afraid that if they speak out, they'll be next, and I can understand why. <clears throat> uh, Indonesia, you see there, is the largest Muslim country in the world. We may not think of it that way. More Muslims in Indonesia than any other country. Um, our, my colleague Lincoln Steed and, and John Graz were the first Anglos to go in to a remote part of Indonesia after there was uh, an outbreak of violence. A lot of churches and mosques were destroyed and miraculously the Adventist compound was spared. But it was at considerable risk to their lives that they went in to try to build bridges with the imams there, with the Islamic leaders. So you see the most serious legal restrictions and then the uh, lighter colors, uh, more moderate legal restrictions. This slide shows social hostilities involving religion. And again, India now uh, ranks at the top. They have somewhat better or lesser restrictions legally, but the Hindu nationalists have been destroying churches. There's been a lot of violence and persecution of Christians. Several years ago when James Standish was serving at the General Conference, one of our churches in a remote area was destroyed and James tells the story of going over there representing the church and before he went to the region where the church was, he stopped in at the American Embassy and he asked um, questions about, you know, the region. And the, the, the folks at the Embassy didn't know very much. They couldn't tell him very much. He said, well, why not? He said, because it's unsafe. Uh, we haven't been there. And they asked him to bring back a report. So, you know, he's going to go to this place that they're, they're afraid to go. And he, he's accompanied by some of the church leaders from the division there and from the conference. And, and uh, they travel up and, and they find a small group of Adventist church members worshiping under a tree. The church had been destroyed. The uh, pastor's home and the head elder's home had been destroyed. The pastor had been literally slaughtered and hacked to pieces in the middle of the town square. And after the church service, you know, they greet the members and they talk to the head elder and, and you know, James says to, to the head elder, you know, we're here from, from the church headquarters, from the general conference. We're very concerned about what's happened here. Is there anything that we can do to help? And the elder looks at him and he says, we have God. We don't need anything. And here we are in Southern California, and all I can think of is, we have everything, but 
do we realize our need for God? With so many being persecuted around the globe, <clears throat> I'm reminded of this verse from Exodus. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. I'm quite sure that God sees. I'm quite sure that God cares. But I, I don't know if, if we just turn a blind eye. Do we see? Do we care? Oops, let's try this again. How do we respond? How do we respond when we see persecution overseas, when we see intolerance at home? What is our approach? Is it to build walls? or to build bridges. China built this great wall over centuries, mile after endless mile. That was their political strategy, a strategy that has been proposed politically. I'm not going to indulge in political discussion from the pulpit today. I'm looking at how we as Christians approach these issues, walls or bridges. So our scripture reading this morning from the Sermon on the Mount, and at this time in our nation's history, I think the Sermon on the Mount is extremely relevant and important to us. There's actually been some discussion publicly among Christian leaders uh, who have insisted that the Sermon on the Mount is not relevant to our political life, to our national life. I find that fascinating because, of course, I have long held that this is an example of why America is not properly understood to be a Christian nation. Because if we're going to be Christian, then we should be internalizing the principles of the Sermon on the Mount, and we don't expect our nation to um, turn the other cheek, as it were, and to love our enemies. That's not how nations are expected to behave. But then nations don't have a soul to save or hellfire to suffer, do we? Individuals are those for whom Christ died. You and I are those who Christ loves, not nations. Well, I won't read it over again, but I'll point out the critical importance at a time when our nation is so polarized. Jesus is teaching us to love our enemies. Isn't that right? Um, and this, by the way, is the measure of perfection as described by Jesus himself. Now, I came into the Adventist church at a kind of a crisis time in 1979. Desmond Ford gave this famous speech there at Irwin Hall at Pacific Union College, and I was there. And there was a lot of doctrinal turmoil, a lot of discussion about perfection. And I got this kind of Adventist idea that perfection was, you know, not eating chocolate chip cookies, and it was, you know, what you ate, and this sort of thing. And, and you know, that didn't really compute with me. I, I, I did think that perfection had something to do with love and compassion and kindness, and not so much with diet. Um, Jesus insists that if we want to be perfect, our perfection is our attitude towards our enemies. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a very challenging text for me. Um, I have had some enemies in my life. Anybody here had some enemies or have some enemies? Do you love them? You don't have to answer. But I suspect that you will agree with me that we are not really humanly capable of loving our enemies ourselves. This is not, it's not natural. 
You know, there's a reason why they're our enemies. We don't like them. We hate them. We're very, you know, we have a, a hard time forgiving them for how they've treated us. Is it even possible to do what Jesus is telling us that we need to do to change our attitude towards the people that we think the least of, the worst of in our lives? Well, look what Jesus did. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we are saved by his life. Jesus didn't die for his friends. He died for his enemies. Well, he had friends. He died for them too. He died for his enemies. While you and I were his enemies, he died for us. I suggest to you this morning that it is only the love of Christ in our hearts that gives us the ability to love our enemies. Is that fair? And as we look at our topic of overcoming religious intolerance, I think the same holds true there. It has to be Christ in our hearts. Now, I'm a lawyer. I'm also Jewish. And so I can relate to um, the gentleman who encountered Jesus here in Luke chapter 10, who was also a Jewish lawyer, and who came to Jesus and asked him, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you are ever confused about this, this is a good illustration of how we know that Jesus is Jewish. And I'll illustrate with the old joke about the priest who asked the rabbi, why is it you Jews always answer a question with a question? And the rabbi says, so why not? <laughs> Jesus answers the rabbi not with one question, but with two. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, and the answer he gave is the central part of every synagogue service of Jewish worship from the beginning of time. It's found in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your... Uh, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, great answer. My son just started law school here at USC this year. We young lawyers are taught, be careful not to ask the question that you don't know the answer to, especially at trial. The lawyer was great. He gave a great answer. Jesus commended him, but he made the mistake of asking one too many questions. And the story that follows, I think we're all familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. It was an answer Jesus gave to the lawyer's second question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? The lawyer did not like the answer because the Samaritans were hated by the Jews even more than the Romans, even more than they hated the Romans. But I suggest to you today that the question, who is my neighbor, is very relevant to us as Christians, as Americans. It's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Who is my neighbor? Are those slaving away in sweatshops in Southeast Asia, many of them under the age of 10? Literally hundreds of thousands of children working 12, 14-hour days so that we can buy cheap clothing at Walmart? Are these folks our neighbor? Are these children our neighbor? Are folks who are worshiping Allah and believe they're worshiping the same God we are? I think that's true. I think we worship the same God. Are they our neighbor? Our country is not treating them very neighborly. 
What about those who are building our homes, picking our crops, cleaning our hotel rooms, cooking our food, many of whom lack documentation? 800,000 of whom were raised in this country, brought here um, without any say in the matter, and now having their status um, challenged. We have a handout, we have several handouts out on the table in the foyer. One is an information sheet prepared by colleagues in the Lake Union Conference on uh, the DACA program and how those who are eligible to renew their status to renew it. Um, meanwhile, we are certainly urging several uh, entities of the church have already issued statements. The Pacific Union will do so in time. Um, we're going to be working on that this week. But um, we're certainly urging our church members to let your congressional representatives know that it's really important to do something about the DACA program. And, you know, the Trump administration said this is an issue for Congress. Okay, well, Congress, take care of it. That's so important. These are our neighbors. Uh, you may recall recently our president pardoned a notorious sheriff, Joe Arpaio, in, in Arizona. When he was sheriff, the Adventist church lost hundreds and hundreds of church members who fled the state because of the overt hostility uh, on uh, on, on both documented and undocumented immigrants. And there are literally, according to the conference president in Nevada, Utah, there were new churches planted in their territory from refugees from Arizona. So those who are undocumented folks, there's no question, some of them are even church members. But whether they are church members or not, are they still our neighbors? And what about the Syrian refugees and the children? Are they our neighbors? There's a wonderful refugee ministry in the Paradise Valley Church in San Diego. I'm going to be down there in a couple of months and, and learn more about it from Pastor James there. Um, I have been assured by folks from ADRA, folks from World Vision, working with refugees, there is no problem with our, our nation screening of refugees. And we have never seen any kind of terrorist attacks from uh, those who have come through our refugee programs. But we've seen a lot of uh, politics surrounding the refugee issue. Are these our neighbors? Over Christmas time, someone gave me a wonderful devotional by the famous German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And in the very first devotional that I read, Bonhoeffer asks this question, who is this Jesus knocking? Based on the scripture from Revelation 3, uh, one of my very favorite religious freedom scriptures. Why do I say this is a religious liberty scripture? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is here portrayed as a gentleman. He doesn't force his way in. He will knock. He will keep knocking. He will be persistent. But if we want to close the door and go lay down, go ignore him, he'll go away. He's not going to force his way into our lives. We have the privilege and the opportunity to welcome him into our lives. Isn't that right? We have that freedom. And I hope we will exercise that freedom today. I hope everyone will welcome Jesus into their hearts, into their lives today. Amen? But Bonhoeffer asked the question, who is this Jesus knocking? And he made the connection with this very well-known passage in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And I'm going to read some of this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, 
Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Notice he doesn't say that you had all your doctrines straight. You, didn't, you couldn't recite the 28 fundamentals, the Adventist church. I can't. I think I believe them, but I don't think I could recite them. So don't feel bad if you're in the same boat. Wear it all you've off. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I was preaching this sermon a few months ago, and it hit me like a light bulb going off. Jesus does not regard anybody as beneath him. He died for us. We're not the least in his eyes, are we? So why did he use this phrase, inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brothers. It's not because of how he sees people, it's because of how we do, right? And I dare say all of us look down on somebody. None of us are exempt. But who in Scripture is the least? It's Jesus in this famous psalm that is part of the beautiful Handel's Messiah. I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He committed his cause to the Lord. Let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Jesus says, I'm a worm. Jesus becomes the least for us. Who do we look down on? Who do we see as the least? The parable is a parable of judgment. Those who will stand in the judgment are those who learn to see Jesus in others, even in the ones that they don't like, that they look down upon. Do you see that? Recently, I heard somebody for the first time turn the word other into a verb, as in don't, uh, don't other me, or stop othering. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that before we're done, because we have a tendency, as Adv our language as Adventists is othering. What do you call somebody who is not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? A non? Really? They're a non? If you're not a member of this church, you're a non? That doesn't sound very good, does it? doesn't sound right. We are judged by whether with the love of Christ in our hearts, we can learn to see Jesus in others. And it strikes me, I'm going to put this in context now for a minute, because I operate within the political realm, doing legislative work within the legal realm with, with a lot of secular folks, and especially in a blue state like California, religion, conservative religion, has taken on a very bad name. You know that, I hope. There is a perception of 
the church, and it's not just the church, but especially the church, of being full of hatred, full of bigotry, and a lot of it arises because of the LGBT issues and the conflicts over same-sex marriage. But the perception that those who are secular and unchurched have of Christianity and by extension of Jesus is not something that they're likely to be interested in because it's not a very good impression. And in that context, I suggest to you that those who are secular and unchurched are, you know, are not going to see Jesus in us until we learn to see Jesus in them. I hope you'll think about that um, after the sermon and, and ask the Lord to, you know, and, and meditate on that. That was another insight the Lord gave me as I was preaching some time back, that those who really need Jesus our witness is completely ineffective to them until we learn to see Jesus in them. And then they can start to see a different picture of Jesus than what they're getting reading the news and, and hearing about the church in our society. They need to see Jesus in us. And they'll see Jesus in us when we learn to see Jesus in them. So. How do we overcome intolerance? Well, for starters, we have to stop fear-mongering. We have to stop looking at people and being afraid of them because their skin is different, their accent is different, their worship is different, right? There's so much fear-mongering in our politics. Why? Well, for the same reason that advertisers sell sex, politicians sell fear. It's effective. It plays on our worst instincts, our worst emotions. But Jesus tells us, Bible tells us, do not fear. You know, we Adventists were big on the Ten Commandments. I've started a study of commandments that Jesus gave us, New Testament commandments, because there are wonderful imperatives throughout the scriptures. And I don't mean to in any way, um, you know, devalue the Ten Commandments. But over and over again, the Bible tells us, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How do we overcome intolerance? We have to stop looking at the stranger as the other and make them our friend. Because we're not intolerant of our friends, are we? It's only the others that we are intolerant of, the strangers. And right here, I want to suggest to you the need for a fundamental shift in the mindset and the culture and the psychology of Adventism. Throughout our history, we have regarded ourselves as the remnant who has the truth, and others are in need of what God has given to us. And that has led to an attitude of us and them. This attitude is very counterproductive. Now, I believe that we are not the remnant, but part of the remnant. And I believe that God has given us precious truth to be shared with others. But when we look at them, somehow and create these barriers of us and them, we make it much, much more difficult to share what God has given to us, the precious truth. The fact is, who did Jesus die for? 
John 3.16. He didn't die just for the elect. That's a Calvinist view. The Calvinist view is maybe, you know, this section of the church, you guys were predestined to glory and the rest of us, you know, we're going we're gonna to roast in the flames forever and the, we have nothing to say about it. This is not John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved the least, the ones that you regard as the least, Jesus loved. He died for them. Is that right? What does that make them? That makes them our brothers and sisters. So do we treat our brothers and sisters as though they're not part of the family, as they're non-Adventists, or do we go embrace them, put our arms around them, and show hospitality and love them and accept them just the way they are, just the way Jesus did for us? Is that right? We have got to shift our attitude from being hostile. Oh, you know, the Catholics and the Pope. How much do we hear about that? Oh, they're going to, you know, they're the boogeyman. They're going to come after us. And in our nation, you know, we have our, our, our current boogeymen are either undocumented immigrants or, or Muslim terrorists, right? So we're afraid of the Muslims. We're afraid of the immigrants. Adventists are afraid of the Catholics. Come on, guys. It's time to get past all of that, isn't it? We know that there are many in many other places who love Jesus or who would be willing and able to love Jesus if we would just show them some kindness and some compassion, some hospitality, right? We don't know. Who is going to stand with Christ at the end or not? We don't know. Our only goal is to give them a chance, not to drive them away, not to build walls, but to tear down the walls. How are Jews supposed to come to believe in Jesus if we simply you know, continue with the kind of age-old barriers between Christianity and Judaism that have been built up over nearly 2,000 years. Unless we are deliberate in tearing down these walls and reaching out in friendship, they're not going to have any interest at all in our Jesus. Part of the baggage of believing that we have precious truth is it can lead to a ungodly arrogance. Everybody believes they have the truth. Everybody believes they're right. We're in a postmodern era and what everybody believes to be true is true. It's my truth. It's your truth. You know, your truth doesn't matter to me because I have my truth. And now we live in the age of, you know, fake news and everybody's uh, truth, right? And so arrogance needs to be replaced with humility. And we need to show friendship instead of resistance. Next year will be the 70th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights. Article 18, I've quoted here, dealing with freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. We're going to plan some wonderful activities. Um, there is going to be a march on Washington, December 10, which is the actual 70th anniversary. But before we close, I just want to say a word, because this is kind of new to me. We, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we've heard about the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, but so what? Why is it important? It was ratified in 1947, right after the most horrific experience of the mass slaughter of human beings that this world has ever seen after the Holocaust. It was, the effort was led by none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, a famous wife of our recently deceased president, then Franklin D. Roosevelt. And um, prior to the UN Declaration, 
Human rights was not an issue in international diplomacy. There was no shared values of respect for human rights. But now, when our diplomats go and talk to people from Egypt or Saudi Arabia or China or anywhere else, guess what, folks? They can't say, oh, well, that's your values. Human rights, that's a Western thing. That's not our thing. Because they have all subscribed and it is now universal. There are universal shared values about the essential dignity of every human being and basic human rights. And it has transformed the world of, of global relations. It's enormously significant and a wonderful opportunity for us as Adventists to build bridges and to show both our leadership and our respect for the rights of everyone, people of other faiths and other kinds of human rights issues. So I hope you'll take a look at that. One of our friends in another organization uh, at Hardwired Global has started this journey for freedom, especially designed for millennials, for young people, but anybody can do it. And there will be sponsorships for the March on Washington in, uh, in December. And everyone takes a step each month to turn the tide against religious oppression in the world and to become an ambassador for freedom. It's been our privilege for almost 25 years to be upholding the banner of truth and religious liberty as your director of public affairs and religious freedom here in the Pacific Union. And it's been a, a joy and a privilege to worship with you and to share with you. I just, my, my hope and my prayer is to see the culture of our church shift so that we can really uh, embrace a, a new attitude that will make the gospel proclamation effective. Can you share that hope with me? Can you share that prayer with me? Let's pray. Father, I hope and pray that the applause is an affirmation of our need for Christ in our hearts to give us the ability to see Jesus in even those we don't like very much, those that we regard as the least. Lord, we pray for a new spirit within our hearts, within our church, that as we learn to see others in Jesus, see, I'm sorry, as we learn to see Jesus in others, that they would see Jesus in us and would come to know you and love you as we do. And Lord, if there are any here today who who don't know you or have not fully surrendered their lives to you. I know that your spirit is at work, and I pray that uh, they would say yes to you in their hearts right now, or even just raise their hands to you and say yes and welcome Jesus and make a full and complete commitment of their lives. We, we love you, Christ. We ask these in your precious name.